Hello, everyone, and welcome to Conversations with Kate. I'm so glad that you're with me tonight because I have an extraordinary guest, someone that you know and maybe don't know, uh, a multifaceted and, and amazingly talented musician, namely Dr. Tom Mueller. Welcome, Tom. Well, thank you. It's so good to be here. And uh, you are no stranger to uh, Zoom because you've been Zooming with your students at Concordia University for the last six months, right? Yep. We have spent a lot of time on Zoom, but mm -hmm. as so many of us have. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you for being here tonight. And as I, I mentioned, there's friends in the chat, including Jim Buonamani and Comfort is in the chat. Carl Edwards and Dr. Greg Dern and Stuart Falk and others will be joining too. So I have so many things to ask you about because your life is so multifaceted and you are so multi-talented. So where to start? I think I want to I want to start in your um, your childhood because from what I've heard, is this right? You were homeschooled. I was. You yes. were homeschooled. Did you grow up in Maine? I grew up in Maine. Okay, homeschooled in Maine and in a musical family. Is that right? Yeah. All right. So tell us about how that worked. Why were you homeschooled, and um, and how did you um, come uh, to learn music in this musical family of yours? So both of my parents were originally from Missouri, um, and my dad in particular grew up um, in a musical family himself. My grandmother, his mom, was a church organist and mm -hmm. a pretty skilled amateur pianist. But he, he, after studying classical piano for several years, decided that he really wanted to be in folk music. So mm -hmm. he learned the banjo, he learned the guitar and some other instruments. And... Um, you know, for, for most of his life was involved in different bands and, you know, writing songs and doing all sorts of musical. So he things. was a full time professional musician, it sounds like. No, not not full time. I mean, he, he pursued other, you know, academic and professional interests as his career. But but music was always a really important part of his life, both mm -hmm. um, as a listener, but also as a performer. Mm -hmm. um, and then my mom's side of the family, kind of similar circumstances. We had some musicians um, several generations back. Um, very good amateur folk musicians. Mm. Um, and she, you know, what didn't really play any of those instruments growing up, but she was around the music and, mm. and loved it. So they both met in, met in Missouri and then their mm. honeymoon was driving a U-Haul to Maine where they settled down. And my, my dad had gotten a job in, in Maine. This is in the that is 80s. not a honeymoon. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> you all from Missouri. <laughs> it's uh, a little unconventional, but yeah. it worked for them. Very so, small, um, it's sweet. And so they, what made, what made them move to Maine? My, my dad had been to the Northeast a couple of times and it just really resonated with him. I mean, he, he grew up in St. Louis, so mm -hmm. suburban environment and, mm -hmm. you know, central Midwest. And he went to school in Utah, spent a lot of time out West and in the mm -hmm. Northeast. Um, he liked to ski. Mm -hmm. and so I think just, you know, being in a rural place where uh -huh. they had four seasons and lots of snow and you could go mm -hmm. ice skate and go ski and do all that yeah. stuff was really attractive for him. So just so, when they had gotten engaged, my dad had a job offer from a uh -huh. company based in Maine. And so um, I just decided to go for it. So didn't. you got so so they moved to Maine and and you were living in a rural area. Yeah, so I, I grew up in a town called Oakland, which is mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's a very small town, but it's next to a slightly larger town called Waterville, which is probably oh. best known as the home of Colby College. And amazing skiing, right? Or is that different than Waterville Valley? No, that's different from Waterville Va okay. Valley. Yeah, but <laughs> Colby but, College. Okay, so it was a college town. Yeah, so so small town, a total population was maybe 18 or 20,000 people mm -hmm. in the whole area when I was growing up. Um, and we lived, you know, a ways out too. Mm -hmm. um, so very rural environment. And, you know, I grew up working on farms and dealing with livestock and all that kind of stuff. Wow. So, you know, when probably 1990 or so, when I was four or five years old, and they were starting to think about, about schooling, you know, homeschooling just seemed like a good fit, given the circumstances, our location. I was ho homeschooled all the way through the end of high school, as were all of my siblings. Amazing. And, and um, 
And was it mainly because you were way out in the country? That was a lot of it. I mean, it was just, you know, I, I don't know how familiar you are with the history of homeschooling in the country, but at that time it was really kind of a French thing, but, you know, more of like an alternate lifestyle mm. associated with, you know, hippies and mm -hmm. like back to the earth movement mm -hmm. rather than being so closely associated with um, like religious conservatism as it often is okay. now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It is funny how it has the different sort of flavor now, maybe. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, that transition that. really happened in the nineties, but, but one of the reasons they got into it was more, you know, in the aftermath of like, 60s and 70s counterculture and just yeah. you know that kind of life so. so you really you worked on the farm yeah I mean, I mean we were not doing commercial farming mm -hmm. but like we always had livestock we always had chickens um you know we usually had a large garden and then mm -hmm. you know my siblings and I usually worked on the farms surrounding us mm -hmm. uh, during the summer so amazing yeah, different kind so, of life a different kind of life um, Nancy Redford is uh, in the chat and she says that they summered in that neck of Maine for a few summers, beautiful and yes, very remote. Yeah. So I, um, most of the state is, but that's I know, one of the more remote. I know. I, I, it's amazing. It's a huge state, isn't it? It is. Yeah. So Did you ever I, have the chance to go up there when you were living in? Oh, yeah. Northeast? Yeah, definitely. But mostly just to just to Portland. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but a few times further up and I remember almost running out of gas because there was no gas station. <laughs> I think you have to know where the gas stations are before you start traveling in Maine, you know, because you can yeah. just find yourself yeah. in a, in a, in a tight spot, but I, it's gorgeous, 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 gorgeous. And one of our beloved, um, parishioners, <clears throat> Joanne O'Donnell lives mm -hmm. in the, in Harpswell. Harpswell, which is right in the Bay Area near Portland, right? Um, yeah, it's a little bit northeast of Portland, mm -hmm. so about an hour and a half from where I grew up. So, oh, nice. Yeah. So, so what was it like being homeschooled? Did you, as a kid, did you like it? Did it? Did it? Did you ever think, I wish I were at the at the public school, or, or were you were you pleased with the with the way that it was? I, I mean. I had never had the experience of being in public school, so I really didn't have anything to compare it to. But but I was fairly independent growing up. And in retrospect, that's the part of it that I really enjoyed, just the ability to kind of pursue my own interests. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I had plenty of time for things like music and some of my mm -hmm. other passions when I was a kid. Um, and my parents were proponents of what was called the unschooling movement at that time. Um, and the idea is you kind of step away from the sort of schedules and mm -hmm. academic prescriptions that you usually see in, especially in elementary setting mm -hmm. and let kids follow their own interests. So, you know, a lot of my experience was just being dropped off at the library and you know, pick out piles and piles and piles of books and mm -hmm. pursue different projects and things like that. So, so looking back, I think it was that kind of freedom and mm -hmm. flexibility and the, the ability to follow my own interests that I appreciated the most about it. I think what's um, and nice music was a really important part of that too. Mm -hmm. so. so I think what's nice about that following your own interests is you don't have to do one topic for an hour and then switch to another topic and another topic. You can you can do a deeper dive into what's what's really capturing your curiosity. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds and, like you know, I, you, you learned so much. Yeah, I you know, as a parent now and as an educator, I can't say that I'm complete proponent of that method because you know <laughs> I think there are some important things that kids may not come to of their own volition mm. but on the other hand I mean there are some elements that I think mm -hmm. can be good for the right for the right child and the right yeah. situation are you the old are you the oldest I am uh, uh -huh. I have um six younger brothers and sisters there's a little um there there's a sort of an ode to Maine happening in the chat right now <laughs> <laughs> Stuart Falk is saying, my memories of summers as a child in Maine are of cold water of the Rangel. I don't know what the Rangel is. R and Rangely, probably. Rangely, yeah, maybe. Yeah. And, um, and then he says, lakes and big mosquitoes. <laughs> well, that's yep. true in New England. The mosquitoes <laughs> are something else. And Betsy Anderson says that her son marked it outward bound outside Cambria. And it's gorgeous. 
just gorgeous country. I think, I think we've all, we're all um, sort of feeling um, the fantasy of that, that kind of a childhood, that bucolic childhood, young Tom, you know, learning this instrument, learning that instrument, you know, <laughs> studying physics, uh, whatever, uh, um, animal husbandry, all the things that you can learn also in a rural area. I mean, it, it sounds amazing. It was definitely a unique experience. And I, I mean, I didn't realize how unique it was until I, of course, got out in the real world and started utterly unique. Notes with my friends. Yeah. But, so yeah, um, how did you that. learn um, to play different instruments? So, so my, my first real musical experience was um, listening to my dad perform with his band. And they'd often have rehearsals in our house. So musicians would come over and play. Nice. A lot of bluegrass, um, folk music, country, that kind of stuff. Um, but he also had an enormous record collection with mm -hmm. all sorts of things, classical music, a lot of, um, you know, classic rock, r and I mean, you mm -hmm. name it. And it was just always kind of on in the background. So, you know, for me, I kind of grew up with these two tracks of some classical music and stuff that I'd hear in church or hear around the house, but also always having you know, string instruments and a lot of folk mm -hmm. music happening as well. So, you know, so when of... you're a very small child and the living room um, after dinner is filled with musicians, right? What did that feel like? Did it, did you love it? I was always fascinated by it. And, um, you know, my favorite thing to do was when I was very small, just go sit in a banjo case or a guitar case, which, you know, when you're a child, you can actually fit in one of those cases. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just, you know, to watch everybody playing and watch the fiddler and the bass player and guitars and banjos. And, you know, I usually get to sent to sent to bed while they were still rehearsing. So I'd fall mm -hmm. asleep, like hearing, you know, the voices and the music drifting upstairs. So, um, but, it, you know, it's just like learning a language. Like you really learn by osmosis at that age and in those circumstances. So mm -hmm. for me and my brothers and sisters, I mean, we had all of these instruments around and it was just kind of natural for us to start trying to figure out how to play them. But what about the, the sort of the practice regimen? I mean, how did, how did you, you, you know, you hear about, about um, parents as, they're, as their children are learning to play an instrument having to be really tough about getting them to practice certain number of minutes or hours a day. And w was there that kind of pressure on you or how did you, I, I understand the osmosis, but how did you perfect? So I, I mean, I can address that too, because I've been on both sides of that equation yeah. <laughs> as a musician and a teacher. Yeah. Um, but I, the first formal lessons that I took were violin lessons starting when I was five. Um, you know, I just kind of experiment. What's that? Did you do the Suzuki method? I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, you know, I had tried playing different instruments, but I really loved the fiddle and thought it would be really cool to learn how to fiddle like I was hearing in the bluegrass bands. Mm -hmm. um, and there just wasn't a good teacher and a good outlet for studying that. So my parents put me in Suzuki violin as kind of a stopgap. I don't know how familiar you are with that method, but a lot of it is done by ear. Um, and kind of by road, following that the language-based model of learning. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, you know, my, my first run with violin was not real great in retrospect. I mean, I did okay with it, but, you know, the structured things you're talking about, like needing to practice regularly and, you know, to practice things in a systematic way, which is important for learning any skill, not just an mm -hmm. instrument. Um, I really struggled with that. So I took violin lessons off and on until I was probably eight or nine. Then I took a break because it mm -hmm. just, you know, I wasn't happy. My parents weren't happy. So, um, but I kept playing folk music, you know, during that time. So, you know, mostly on my own, but just experimenting and self-guided. Then when I was 11, I started taking piano lessons. Um, and I, I think just coming back to that on a different instrument and being a little bit older, and more mature and focused mm -hmm. like that. It just really clicked for me. Mm -hmm. It just really made sense in a way that violin hadn't. And I, you know, I ended up studying violin for four or five more years after that as well, mm -hmm. but it's not a strong instrument for me by any means, but it was keyboard instruments and other string mm -hmm. instruments that like really just clicked and felt natural. 
But you play the violin and you play the fiddle, right? A, a little bit. I mean, not, mm-hmm. not to any great degree anymore, but, but I could but get around. something about the keyboard that really sort of the age you were and the keyboard itself that it just clicked in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I mean, it's hard to describe, but, you know, I, many people I know have like hobbies or mm-hmm. like lifelong interests or pursuits or even careers that just like felt right to them from an early age. It's like, this is what I have to do. Like, this is the thing that makes sense. And I, I think for a lot of musicians, uh, professional musicians who have really pursued one instrument or specialty, they have some sense of that too. You know, it's just, they might play other instruments. They might have a lot of other good skills, but there's one thing that really, really clicks for them. So how does that relate then to the practice regimen, that, that piece of it? Does the clicking make the, the practice more um, doable? I, I mean, it did for me with piano. I mean, I usually at that age when you're starting off with lessons, you know, the expectation would be to practice maybe 20 or 30 minutes a day. And, um, you know, there generally isn't an expectation that you can ask a beginner at that age to do more. But, but even from the beginning, I remember just loving it. You know, I want to play for an hour and a half or two hours or three oh, hours. And, wow. Um, you know, we, but, but also to do it in like a, like a focused methodical way that I hadn't done before. Um, classical in, in, music, right? The classical. Yes. Yeah. 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 So in, in, I mean, in those circumstances, if you spend three hours of your time every day on anything, you'll, you'll improve at it very rapidly. Yeah. Like that's what I experienced yeah. at that age. That's wonderful. So this is when you were eight or nine. Um, 11, when 11. I started piano, yeah. 11, and um, meanwhile, lots of brothers and sisters came along. <laughs> How many yeah. of you are there? There's seven of, seven of us total. Okay, so I think there's two sisters. Um, yeah, two sisters and three brothers. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, so, three sisters and three brothers. Oh, three sisters. <laughs> yeah, I can't do that. Stop and do the math. <laughs> three sisters and three brothers. So the house kept filling up and filling up, right? Yeah. When was the family bluegrass band, the, the Mueller's, born and how? So, so the roots of it happened when I was probably 10 or 11. And, you know, in addition to everything else, I had kept fiddling and playing other instruments. Um, and I forget exactly how it happened, but um, my dad had, his band had a gig and mm-hmm. the fiddler couldn't make it to it. So they needed a fiddler. So, so I had been kind of playing a little bit and learning some of the songs with them, but you know, not, not really with the intention how old that I'd be performing with them. I think I was 11. Um, you know, so, so they knew about this a couple of weeks in advance and they just, I basically got pressed into service. So, you know, started learning more of the tunes, um, yeah. you know, and got up and played and it was, a little rocky, but we got through it. And then I started playing with, with that group on a more regular basis. And that is basically how it went. Like some, you know, there'd be some conflict or somebody had to leave the band for whatever reason. And my dad would just replace them with a child. playing. <laughs> an instrument. So, so over time, like the, the outsiders gradually cycled out. That is the family members gradually cycled in. And so, you know, about the time that I left to go, to college for my undergrad, it was just completely family at that point. Wow. And so that's when we really like started performing as mm-hmm. the Mueller's. And did you, and you traveled around, did you travel around Maine or travel around uh, New England? Well, it, it, at that point we were mostly just playing in state, mm-hmm. you know, maybe go down to Massachusetts or New Hampshire every once in a while, but mm-hmm. you know, pretty, pretty casual stuff. Yeah. Um, so I, I went to college and basically didn't, play with them for maybe four or five or six years. I mean, I'd sit Mm -hmm. in every once in a while, but, um, you know, while I was at college doing other stuff and then doing my master's degree, um, they, they got under management, they got a record deal and they started playing a lot. I mean, going Uh on more tours throughout the country. So much more of a family, a family business, right? Yeah. Um, and so that all happened, you know, when I was not actively playing with them and I was okay. doing college and grad school. And then when I finished my master's degree, my sister wanted to go to college. And so we just, you know, Switched. I came, yeah, we basically swapped again. 
So she oh went to college, God. and then I I came back playing guitar and mandolin and functioning as what what we would call the MD, the musical director. So doing a lot of the arranging and you know kind of day to day musical direction. Wait, so you also yeah. when did you learn how to play the guitar and the mandolin? I just kind of picked it up, but um, I, I took a little bit of guitar lessons when I was a teenager. And then I actually started uh, college as a jazz guitar major. Did you year. really? Yeah. Ah. So that, that was my most, you know, serious stint of mm-hmm. guitar experience before going back to the band. All right. So now I, I, is it okay if we put up a photograph? This is the album oh, yeah. from, I think <laughs> this is from 2009's The Mueller. Do I say Mueller or M- Mueller, uh, Mueller. Or Mueller. Mueller. Justin. Yeah. Oh, Justin's got it up. Can you see everyone? This is the best, uh, the best album cover ever because <laughs> it tells an elaborate story. I don't know the story really, but as you, if you can see, the parents are kissing. Um, one of the one of your brothers is looking aghast. Another one's yawning. <laughs> And let and and I think a sister looks bored, and yep. and another brother looks like he'd like to be somewhere else. <laughs> and you and you look like a music director. You look like you have very lofty musical thoughts going through your mind. Now tell us the real story of this. What is this? What is the dynamic in the band, and what does this story tell us? Um. So we. We, we took that in a theater in Maine. That's like this historic theater. And we were finishing this album and we needed the album art, like the cover. So, mm-hmm. you know, our photographer came in and we, we had all these great ideas for how we're going to have like the, you know, the proscenium and like the beautiful theater and the lights and like these mm-hmm. amazing velvet curtains and everything. Mm-hmm. And it was just a total bust. Like, <laughs> you know, the lighting, like the lighting wasn't working and everybody was in a terrible mood. <laughs> and like, uh. <laughs> just, I mean, we, we were probably there for like two hours just taking different pictures and different lineups. And I mean, I'm sorry to say it just sucked. Like we didn't oh, get anything. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> so, so, but we were in this theater. And so, you know, we're at the end, just like, what are we going to do? And we were all like sitting in those chairs sprawled out like that. Yeah. And the photographer just started taking pictures of us right there. And so that's, that's how we ended up with that shot. It was just kind of this random thing, you know, not really looks like some wonderful. It looks like some very natural family shtick going on there. Yeah. Is that so right? I, I mean, it does, as, as you picked up on, I think give you a lot of insight into some of the family <laughs> dynamics and personalities. Um, yeah, you know, it's a really cool shot. Like, it's fun to think back at it now. And it was just, you know, I think photographers know what it's like to get a lucky shot. Yes, it's wonderful. One. I mean, I and I and and friends on the uh, on this uh, interview tonight, I listened to uh, this album, the the Mueller's, on um, Spotify last night, and it's wonderful. And one of your brothers, I think, is singing. Is it or yes. yeah, just yeah, I think both of them sing. Yeah, it's fantastic. It, it, it has a kind of, their singing has an Appalachian rawness to it that, that really touched me as a Kentuckian, you know. I just, I yeah. just loved it. Wonderful stuff. Yeah. Um, Thank you. The music direction really shines through, of course. <laughs> yeah. But so we've been that. talking a lot about folk and bluegrass and rural Maine and, um, and, this, and this family band, it, which is just fascinating to me. Um, and so I suppose it's not surprising that when you went to college, you studied music, jazz guitar, right? Mm-hmm. So um, what was that like? So I, um, I, I mean, my college experience early on was kind of an accident because I, being homeschooled, I had actually finished high school when I was 15 oh, and my. there was, there was nothing else to do. I, mm-hmm. I mean, like I was out of coursework. And so you know, my, my eventual plan at that point had been to go to music school. And mm-hmm. I was really interested at that point in doing, you know, jazz, um, which I had started playing as part of my piano studies and was really fascinated by. Um, so, so my hope and dream was to go to a school like Oberlin or Berkeley or something like that and, and study jazz. Um, but I was 15 and my parents, in retrospect, rightfully didn't want me to go off at the age of 15 oh. to you know, a big college like that. Um, 
so I started taking classes at a uh, University of Maine campus that was down the road from us. It was, you know, I say down the road, and it was about 20 miles away. Yeah. But it was close enough that I could commute and, you know, continue to live with my parents, which was mm -hmm. gracious of them and good for me since I was 15. Yeah. So I started taking classes in their jazz program, which was actually a really solid program. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the real strengths in the state for jazz education. Mm -hmm. So my idea was I take a few classes and then eventually transfer and go finish at another school. And I just, you know, I was really enjoying it and got to know some of the faculty and I just ended up completing my degree there. Mm -hmm. you know, it was a really good fit. Um, mm -hmm. Very small department. I think there were only three, three full-time music professors, which is tiny. And so you maybe, were finished with college by the time most of us were starting it. <laughs> so I, I graduated when I was, I just turned 19. I, I started my master's when I was 19. Oh so that my was gosh. my college experience. You're a prodigy. Um, so you started your master's now. That was it at, was that at Eastman? Um, no, I went to the University of Notre Dame. Okay. You went, um, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and what, so that, what was that about? What was that, stu that field of study? So I, you know, I had grown up playing the organ as a teenager. And my, like I mentioned, my grandmother was an organist and, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we went to a very liturgical Lutheran church and then later an Episcopalian church oh. um, where I sang in the choir and I took organ lessons from the parish organist. Um, and I just, you know, as a late, in my late teens, I was doing all this jazz stuff and playing mm -hmm. all sorts of music, but I, I continued to do church music and I was playing part-time for a small church um, mm -hmm. in central Maine. And I just felt more and more drawn to it. Like I just, you know, I love the instrument and, you know, I love to practice and, you know, perform and play for churches. And I just kind of reached this crossroads when I finished my undergrad where, you know, if I needed to, to pursue jazz seriously, I would have needed to move to New York City or, or Boston and really go for it. But at the same time, I was really being drawn towards church music and, and playing the organ. So I, I applied to different programs and you know, I think for a lot of programs looking at me coming in with kind of a patchwork of different musical experiences and a degree in a completely different discipline, like they mm -hmm. kind of took a pass on me. Um, but but I got a full ride to Notre Dame in the Masters of Sacred Music program, which they had just established. And so they were they were trying to get students for this program. And I just kind of came along at the right time and really clicked with the professor there, Craig Kramer, mm -hmm. who um, you know, went to actually went to school at Eastman with Jim Buonamani. So oh, the connection nice. there. <laughs> um, and it just, it worked out great. I mean, it was a really phenomenal experience. And for me, you know, I was changing a lot of gears personally, but also musically, basically starting over in a new field. And it was an incredible experience. Really yeah. So it. that was, was that two or three years? Two years. Two years of, of sort of intensive sacred music organ uh, yeah. learning. That's amazing. And then yeah. that was your first time probably not living in Maine. That's true. Wow. So there's another yeah. transition. And then and, and and then what happened next? You you now you've become this this sort of fully developed sacred musician, uh, sacred music musician, and um, you've got your master's degree. But now I, 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 this, your career has been extraordinary. I mean, you're, um, you're a famous organist and you've played all over and um, you've won awards and, uh, and now you also teach organ. And how did you get from graduating from Notre Dame to sort of really launch this, this career? This um. Well, yeah, when I, I finished at Notre Dame, I was, you know, again at a crossroads and, you know, I had applied for some some jobs as a, a director of music or as an organist, mm -hmm. different churches. Um, and it was also looking at doctoral programs to go mm -hmm. on for further study. And, you know, like I mentioned before, that was the point where my family's band was yeah. doing really well and they were touring and had this, you know, their record deal and all of this stuff. And my sister herself wanted to go to college. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I talking to the rest of my family, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, I could come back and do this for a year or two and, mm -hmm. you know, keep working towards 
uh, going to a doctoral program or applying mm -hmm. for a church position. And that's what I ended up doing. So actually, right. I, I moved back to Maine and, um, you know, continued to do some part-time organ and church music and mm -hmm. composing mm -hmm. work, which I had been um, doing previously, uh, but was really full-time playing guitar in the band and dealing with a lot of the booking and logistics, logistical <laughs> support. Um, How was this? Did, did, did this band um, get along well or was there a lot of, um, you know, you hear about how bands argue all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we used to joke that, you know, no matter how bad a conflict was, we couldn't fire anybody. So but <laughs> I think that was your dad's secret plan all along to get it to get a band where where <laughs> maybe in yeah. retrospect. Um, but, that, you know, we all got along pretty well. I, there was definitely friction at some points. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think we're, we're able to get along really well as a family, but also as a musical entity, which yeah. know, is a whole separate beast to consider. What, so. a, what a way to be a family, you know, that most yeah. of us don't experience. I mean, that, that sort of way that you, that you blend as a, as a group. It's, yeah, it must have been, it must create a bond of some kind, does it? A different sort of bond? I, I think so. I mean, I remain very close with almost all of my siblings and, you know, my parents and, mm -hmm. you know, I think they would say the same. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a really interesting experience for all of us to have together. Yeah. Uh, unique. So a few years on the road with the band and, um, and then, and then Eastman. Yeah. So, so, you know, we did the band, pretty pretty much full-time for about two years and then um you know it was right about the time that the recession hit mm -hmm. and you know just the economics of the music scene but especially mm -hmm. the folk music scene really got difficult yeah. and so we, we pulled back on a lot of the performing and you know we'd stay busy performing locally on mm -hmm. the weekends um but it was a good time for me to go back to church music, which yeah. was my long-term plan anyway. So mm -hmm. um, I had a couple of positions in Maine and ended up in, you know, a position that was close to full-time. I think it was about 30 hours a week, um, you know, directing choirs and serving as the organist and running a concert mm -hmm. series for a church. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I did, did a lot of performing and uh, performing recitals during that time. And that was kind of the launch pad for me to go back to school to pursue my doctorate. Mm -hmm. in, so I started that in, in, in organ, organ performance. Yeah. Organ performance. And so um, is Eastman the place to go? For organ, I would say yes. I mean, it's, okay. um, I mean, there's several other very good organ programs in the country, but I think the unique thing about, about Eastman is that they've, they've really focused a lot of their attention on building the collection of instruments that they have available and also mm -hmm. developing a faculty that's really skilled in all styles of music making on these instruments. So they, they have some organs that have actually been imported from Europe, like from mm -hmm. Italy that were built in the 1700s. And you can play these and have the experience of playing a historical instrument, which normally you actually have to go to Europe to play. Mm, that's um, amazing. Yeah, so, so it's just the, the way that they've built that program over the years mm -hmm. is that they've really invested in giving students not just access to great faculty and teachers, but access to wonderful instruments. Um, the institution has one of the best academic music libraries in the world, mm -hmm. um, including a lot of specific historical holdings for organ and sacred music and keyboard. Um, so it's just, you know, for me, it was the total picture. Like I loved doing research Mm -hmm. um, as well as performing and perfecting that part of my craft. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for, for that combination of disciplines, Eastman is really the place. Mm. So, um, and, and, and the, the faculty, there must have been amazing uh, mentors. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, the opportunity to study with some people who are leaders in the field. Yeah. Um, and just brilliant musicians and teachers in their own right. It was really formative for me. Now, for anybody who doesn't know, Eastman is in Rochester, New York. Rochester, right? New York. Yeah. Very good. Where Jim yeah. is from. So. Where Jim is from. That, and Jim studied yeah. at Eastman as well, right? He did uh, okay. for his undergrad. 
for his undergrad. Uh huh. Yeah. So, um, so there you were, and and while you were there, um, uh, what did you? What was your? What was your research focus? So I, I, I had a couple of different areas that I was investigating. Um, one of them was the, the way in which the organ was used to, for playing um, like music with orchestras and large choirs in the classical period. So, mm-hmm. so Haydn, Mozart, composers mm-hmm. of that era. Um, so, so we know that there was a lot of sacred music that was being written and used in church services, like large mm-hmm. festive occasions. Mm. And it was typical for the organist to play along with a larger ensemble of violins and cellos and you know, trumpets and woodwinds and timpani, as well as large choirs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we know they played. We don't know a whole lot about how they played, hmm. like the registrations, the sounds that they would have used, mm. um, you know, the notes, how they would have selected the notes that they would play out of a large orchestral um, huh. score or composition. So um, that's what I spent most of my time researching. Uh, mm-hmm. My other, I, you know, this is almost random, but my other passion project that I was working on. Jenny Lynn. Time, Jenny Lynn. Very good. Do you know Jenny Lynn? <laughs> yeah, but but tell us why why was Jenny Lind uh, uh, the American reception of, of of the singer Jenny Lind? Why why did that capture your imagination, or how? So J- Jenny Lind was probably the most famous performer of her day and age in the eighteen forties and eighteen fifties, and um, you know at that time, considering the difficulties of getting information and and music and musicians back and forth across the Atlantic. Um, music tended to be more regional than it is today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Ginny Lind was one of the first figures to really like have global renown as a performer. A superstar. Yes. Yeah. And and really in many ways set the template for other celebrity performers, not just in classical music, but Mm -hmm. across all genres later in the 1800s and even in the 1900s. And was she extraordinary? By all accounts, yes. I mean, this is pre- pre-recorded history. So we don't know what she sounded like, but there's, you know, innumerable descriptions of her singing and, you know, from top flight Mm -hmm. composers and music critics Mm -hmm. of her day, comparing her singing to that of others. So, you know, they, Mm -hmm. they praise her voice, like the tone, the control, but a lot of what people identified as being special about her was the way that she could perform and she could like, like sing a song and embody that song for her audience, oh. you know, which, you know, you think of the experience of seeing mm-hmm. a live performer who is really good at performing. Yes. Yeah. That seems to be what they responded to. So, so anyway, she came to America as a result of a concert tour that was organized by PT Barnum <laughs> in the <laughs> early 1850s. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the circus organizer. And he, he didn't care about music at all. I mean, he was just looking for spectacle, but he had heard about Jenny Lind because the American press was talking about her, mm-hmm. even though mm-hmm. she had never performed here. And he hatched this idea to invest mm-hmm. an enormous amount of money in bringing her over and setting up an American concert tour. And they did. And they, it was wildly successful. She was in the U.S. for about a year and a half and performed all over the place, you know. So Every I can, major I can city at that time. this was a major turning point in the way that we, uh, uh, that the, the world consumed music, right? Yeah. That the beginning of the celebrity system, I guess. Yeah. So, so the, the interesting thing about it that I got really intrigued by initially was that before she came to the United States, um, there were a number of music publishers and composers and arrangers who in an apparent attempt just to cash in on her name, started publishing all of this sheet music that was associated with her. So it'd be something like Jenny Lynn's favorite polka and completely (laughs) unlicensed. I mean, who knows what her favorite polka was, but they'd have her picture on it and it's just some random polka. Wow! Wow. So, So they were using her fame even before she came to the United States to establish themselves and to sell more copies of their music. So there was this whole cottage industry of, so Jenny performers Lynn, were being exploited even back then, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. But, it, you know, it's, it's a really fascinating corner of American uh, musical history, but it's really. The... Sorry. Oh, it, it's just, you know, 
kind of set the template for a lot of what we understand to be the norm for musical practice today with superstar performers and, yeah. you know, think of the Beatles. I mean, that, that yeah. kind of template for their fame and reception was really established by Jenny Lind. And certainly in classical music, I mean, it's never, it's never, I've never even questioned that, that, that it was a celebrity based system, you know? Yeah. Back to yeah. Eastman for a minute. Um, Stuart Falk is wondering, are Eastman and Juilliard in the same football conference? I mean, obviously he means <laughs> <the par. laughs> Um Yeah, I, I, I mean, Juilliard is much more focused uh, on conservatory studies. So, so they do have, you know, quite a good academic music program, but um, it's Juilliard- It's more performance only, yeah. yeah it's, it's more like professionally oriented and performance oriented. and. Um, in, in this country, Curtis Conservatory, the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia is also similar in that it's a pure conservatory that's mm. really performance oriented. Mm -hmm. Eastman has tried to have it both ways. Mm -hmm. So they, they have the conservatory setting and you can pursue just that track if you want to, mm -hmm. but they've also tried to have academics at a level that would match. Yes, um, I see. You know, so you often see those schools like considered in the same breath, but mm. you know, from an academic perspective, that's the real difference between Eastman and- Thank you for explaining that. I never knew that. And Dr. D Greg Dern has a question, he but he begins with a, with a statement. He says, an organ is a sprawling and complex instrument. Would you agree with that? Yes. <laughs> um, and the works of Bach showcase best its range. Would you agree with that? Um. I, I mean, it depends on the sort of organ in question. I think, all right, wait, all right hold on. Let me finish what he has to say. That's okay. all. Um, he says, I drive a large complex tractor. It also drives itself. Does an organ also drive itself in its own way? <laughs> <laughs> if only that was true. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so just to take the first part of the question, yeah. you know, Vox. Vox organ works composed in from the late 1690s to about 17 mid 1740s, um, they do fully exploit the resources of the instrument that Bach knew in that day and age. Uh -huh. So they use, you know, every available note, every available color and dynamic. Um, you know, what's changed in the last 250 years is that organs have gotten larger. You know, there's been different technological innovations mm -hmm. that have allowed for different sounds and different ways mm -hmm. of controlling the sound. Mm -hmm. So, you know, playing Bach on a modern instrument um, you, you rarely would use the full palette of what's possible, I but it's not see. Bach's fault. I mean, he yeah, used he the instrument to the had. fullest yeah. possible degree. Speaking um, of Bach, um, uh, is, I, I read that you performed Bach's complete organ works over a series of 17 concerts in Maine. Is that right? I did. And I, I wonder what was, what inspired you to do that? And what was that like to really to complete it in that way. I, um, I think my initial inspiration from that came from my teacher at Notre Dame, Craig Kramer, who I, I believe has performed the entire works of Bach twice, mm. you know, in kind of a similar number of con concerts. And, you know, I, I studied a lot of Bach's music with him, just really enjoyed his insight into the music mm. as well as, you know, learning more from him about ways to realize that music on a modern instrument in a modern setting. Um, so I think I just kind of tuck that idea away as something to pursue at some point. And, you know, like I said, around that time, the band was winding down and I was starting to look forward to this next chapter of returning mm -hmm. to classical music study. And you know, it just seemed like a good time to do it. So mm -hmm. I think going into that, I had probably learned and performed maybe a third of Bach's organ music. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's quite a lot. I, those were 17 long concerts. <laughs> um, but I just, you know, I kind of just took the plunge and I said, you know, I'm going to do this. Um, there was a, a wonderful woman named Amy Rollins at the church that I was serving at that time um, who was very active in the music program, but also worked as a publicist. And so she, you know, really like embraced this mm -hmm. and helped a lot with the publicity and just drumming up support and and I reached out to a lot of different venues and I just, I made a schedule and I practiced every single day. And, wow. I'm you know, sure learned you were all of that playing, music. But I'm sure when you were playing the Eastman, they were, they loved that. I bet they thought that was pretty cool. 
Yeah, I, I mean, it's a different kind of thing to do. But, yeah. but, you know, for me, especially as a teacher now, just, you know, knowing the totality of what Bach did and how that fits into the larger context of what other musicians were doing at that time period, it's, you know, incredible to have that kind of context. Do you, would, do you, um, do you have a favorite composer to play on the organ? Would it be Bach? Probably Bach. I, I mean, I, I enjoy a lot of different eras and styles of music. Um, I mean, one other that I'm particularly fond of is Herbert Howells. Mm. His music, we, you know, organ and choral music, we yes. use quite a bit at St. James. Um, we talked about really... Herbert Howells when I was interviewing three of the choir members the other night, remember? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I now want to know what is it like for well how did you find your way to St. James and what is it like to be working uh with with this choir and um and music director uh well it's awesome I'll just tell you that but yeah. <laughs> um so so my connection to St. James I, I mean as we talked about Jim Buonamani is an Eastman grad and a Rochester native Right. Um, and I, I had not run into him until I was finishing my degree. Uh, my wife is originally from Riverside. So when I was finishing my degree, she had moved back to Riverside to take a job. Mm -hmm. So we were long distance and I was going back and forth. But we, we had had this long term plan of settling in Southern California after I finished and graduated. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was in Rochester, I was serving a large church downtown called Third Presbyterian. And the music director mm -hmm. there is a wonderful um, colleague named Peter Dubois, who's mm -hmm. a real mentor for me, and also went to Eastman and knew Jim from their uh -huh. time together. Uh -huh. so, so Peter um, had performed on the organ series at St. James, this is probably early 2014. When I was in the final year of my degree, um, and so he he came back and he was like, "Man, this choir is amazing, and this organ was <laughs> great, and everything." But but he knew that I had, you know, was hoping to find a place to land in Southern California, and so I think he had mentioned to Jim that, you know, I was looking for opportunities. Um, so I reached out to Jim the next time I was in California, mm -hmm. and I Jim tells this story better than I do, but and we made plans just for me to come visit the church and we would have mm -hmm. lunch afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I thought it would just be that I was on vacation and yeah. <laughs> didn't, I didn't have my music. Like I didn't have my organ shoes or anything. Oh my goodness. So I walked in and, you know, Jim and I chatted for about five minutes and he's like, well, you know, I'd love to hear you play something. So why don't, you know, I'm just going to leave you here at the organ and, you know, why don't you prepare some repertoire and I'll bring up some choral music for you to read through and um, I mean, I was not prepared for that at all. So I you know, played some things <laughs> in my socks that I had memorized and we went oh, through some no. choral music together. Um, and then he essentially offered me, you know, a, a position and a role at St. James over lunch, which, you know, was incredible for me. Oh, my. I was just blown away by it. Gosh. Um, so, yeah. So it's funny how things happen like that. But Yeah. Yeah. You didn't even have your happen. organ shoes. And for those of you who don't know, organists wear special shoes, right? They're very, yeah. they're very soft. Yeah. So, so imagine like a men's dance shoe, like you use mm -hmm. for ballroom dancing um, mm -hmm. with larger heels. And the idea is that it, it uh, has a very smooth sole on it, usually made mm -hmm. out of leather. And it allows you to um, slide very easily over the pedals and also because it has a larger heel, it's easier to play both with your toe and your heel in a very precise way. Wow. You know, we, uh, this International Baccalaureate Organ Series that we have, um, it's, it's mind blowing. Those of you, if you've never attended it, when, when it starts back up again in 2021, um, it's amazing because the organ is turned around so that we, the audience can see the keyboard, we can see the, the, foot movement to a certain extent. And, and it's just a mind blowing, thrilling experience. And the, the range of organ music that we heard through these concerts, right? They're, they're just amazing. And what I loved about your recital as part of that series last year was that we also heard some pieces that you'd written, didn't we? Mm -hmm. So you've composed yeah. organ music as well. Yeah. So I, you know, simultaneously with all of my other interests as a teenager, I had started um, 
experimenting with composition and actually ended up finishing my undergrad degree in composition um, as well as jazz you piano. You started with... Um, I was jazz yeah. guitar and then I was <laughs> jazz piano and then I was composition. And then I finally graduated. So, Kamula, you are such a prodigy. Oh my gosh. I've always wondered yeah. how you could be so young and have achieved so much. And now I know it's because you started achieving at this world-class level <laughs> at like age five that's how you did it <laughs> most um, of us are just twiddling our thumbs and you're already knocking off the degrees by the way in the chat jim says offering the job to tom was one of the best full caps decisions i've ever made <laughs> well that's very kind and i i mean i i can't say enough about jim and the choir i mean jim just as a colleague but also a, a mentor during my time at St. James, it's, I can't tell you how much I, I have learned from him and continue to learn on a what are the kinds daily of basis. Things, what are the kinds of things that, that you learn as you, you know, uh, as you watch him as a music director and as an organist and all of that? What are some of the things you learn? You know, I, I think a lot of it is just, I, you know, I hope I explain this well. It can be difficult to express musical ideas in words, but... You know, I think Jim is a total musician in the sense that when he's conducting or when he's when he's playing, you know, it's not just the physical apparatus that's engaged, but it's, you know, the mind, but but also the spirit. And I, I mean, I think we we all see this in different ways. Um, but but, you know, just to see somebody who will like completely commit themselves to whatever's going on musically at any moment, you don't see that a whole lot. In the real world, I mean, you see people who will commit themselves physically, or maybe they commit some, themselves mentally. But but to see somebody who commits like every atom of their being to the music in front of them in that moment, I think that's really rare. And and Jim Isn't does that. Rare, huh? I mean, I, so why don't other people do that? I don't know. I mean, I you know I, I've seen very very fine, well known musicians who I. I didn't get the sense that they were as in it in the moment as, as Jim almost always is. Mm. Um, you know, I think, you know, for, for those of us in the choir and, you know, for me at the organ, but also for us as a congregation to have the chance to see him work after, um, uh, to work week after week. I think that's one of the impressions that we, we all take away from it in our own way. Um, you know, I think also just, you know, one, one way in which Jim has... Are you talking about conducting uh, or are you talking about uh, organ performance? Or the, the organ playing as well, certainly, mm -hmm. you know, but, but, you know, the conducting, the leadership. Mm -hmm. But the, the other thing that I've really learned from is Jim's preparation and planning. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's the same with writing a good sermon, right? I mean, the actual delivery is just the tip of the iceberg right. in terms of the thought and preparation and research and reflection and conversation. The journey you took, yeah. <laughs> you know, and for, for any sort of high quality music making, it's the same. You know, it's sometimes it's logistics, just making sure that the right people are going to be there at the right time. But it's also getting to know the music really well and, mm. you know, knowing what you want to accomplish and how you might accomplish it in rehearsal and performance. And I mean, Jim is one of the most prepared musicians that I've ever worked with. And I, I mean, I consider myself to be a very prepared musician as well, but Jim inspires me to go the next step. Really? All the time. Do you try, yeah. to, teach your, do you try to teach your students this, this, this lesson? Oh, every day. <laughs> I mean, it, but, but, you know, in music, as in many other fields, I think that that level of preparation and just critical thinking about what you're doing and what you should be doing that that will take you so far in life, you know, beyond talent, beyond just raw expertise that you may have. I mean, the musician who is prepared and shows up on time and is ready to go, you know, that's those are the people who are successful in the field of music, as are you know, as with many other fields. And what about what about your experience of playing um, with this choir? What is it like that sound? I'm I know that they're considered to be one of the best around. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say I would say the best on the West Coast, in my experience. Um, but I, you know, the, the experience for me as an organist is mm -hmm. 
you know, I, I think we're always called to to lead and to serve as organists, and that can mean different things. So, you know, for example, if I'm leading the congregation in an unfamiliar hymn, I'll I'll have to lead a little bit more because they might not be we not, might not all be familiar with the tune or the rhythm or the words, and you know, that's a situation where as an organist, I'm called to just offer a little bit more musical leadership. You know, there's other situations where we're called to, to serve, maybe to accompany. And so you think of a situation um, like playing with a solo singer or maybe a solo violinist mm-hmm. where, you know, they take the lead, you kind of follow and accompany. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, for me, the richest musical situations are the sort that you find in chamber music where you're both leading and following. But it's it's an un- ensemble of equals, and everybody's you know doing these things in equal measure, really in partnership. And you know, with most choirs, I'm sorry to say, as an accompanist, you usually have to lead a little bit more than Drag- you'd like to. Drag- I, I mean, it, it's really true. You know, a lot of choirs, and it, it's no knock on the choir, but you know, they require a little bit more leadership to function. But you know, I think the incredible thing about working with with Jim, but also the choir, is that we have that kind of symbiosis that you find in the best sort of chamber music, where we are all equal partners together, and we can respond to each other. And mm. you know, I don't have to lead any more than anybody else, and I don't have to accompany more than anybody else. But you know, we're all right there, equal partners in the music making, and you know, especially. At the organ, as an accompanist, it is incredibly rare to have the opportunity to play like that, even once. But week after week is incredible. We're so we're so radically blessed. It's just it it's mind blowing. As you, you well, you've said a few times, week after week, I almost took it for granted when we were back in regular life. But week after week, to 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 hear that sound and to hear you play and to see the great Jim Guanamani conduct. I mean, these are just life-changing experiences, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. Now, what's your relationship with the organ? How do you feel about this organ? How does it, um, uh, what, back to our tractor, <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I think with any sort of instrument, there's instruments you play where they, they are sympathetic to you as a musician. And on the other side, there's also instruments you play that are unsympathetic and you have to work that much harder to make them work. And I, I mean, I've had that experience with guitars, with mandolins, with fiddles, with pianos, but also organs. Um, sometimes you just sit down and like you, you sync with the instrument. You know, and with without sounding too weird, it's almost like it anticipates what you need, or you can easily find like the sort of sound or the sort of response that you're looking for as a musician. And you know, that's the way I felt from day one about the instrument at St. James, as well as the acoustic at St. James, which is mm-hmm. a really important part of how that organ mm-hmm. sounds and works to us. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's just it's a really sympathetic partner for making music. Mm. You know, so so yes, it's very complicated. I mean, you look at the con- at the console and you see all of these buttons and knobs <laughs> and tabs and keys and everything. It looks, it, it looks like the most complicated control panel in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I, I mean, it it is like it's it's a challenge to navigate an instrument of that size. But at the same time, just feeling like the instrument is is sympathetic and it's a partner in music making rather than being unsympathetic and being an obstacle to accomplish what you want to accomplish as a musician. That's a really powerful experience to have as an organist. I know that with the, um, the organ international baccalaureate series, it's always fun after each of the recitals to hear the organist talk about how exciting it was to play this instrument, you know, because they they seem to each, I've never, I've, I've never not heard that, you know, that that they're, they're always a little bit giddy afterwards, you know, and that's, that's 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 fun to see as well. Yeah. So, um, gosh, we could we could talk for uh, we didn't talk about your family, but your wife is also a musician, isn't she? She is. We we met in a choir at Notre Dame, um, and she had started college with a full scholarship as an opera major. So she is an yeah. incredibly talented singer, um, and she she you ultimately ended your, up. Found your Jenny Lind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe so. 
um, so, so she ultimately ended up pursuing study in biochemistry. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, she's a wonderful singer. And we, you know, one nice thing about the pandemic has just been the chance for us to make music together, which, you know, in the normal hustle and bustle of family life, we so what kind of music for. do you play together? And do the girls, your daughters, get involved as well? They they do a little bit. So we'll do a lot of children's songs with them. Um, currently, my wife and I have just been doing a lot of like piano and guitar, piano and mandolin stuff. Mm -hmm. um, we do a lot of folk music. Mm -hmm. um, we've been on a kick of doing a lot of like 80s rock and pop covers. So. <laughs> We have pretty eclectic listening taste around the house. Amazing! Oh um, my gosh! And does so, um, does Billy sit in the in the in the guitar case? <laughs> yep, she that's one of her favorite spots. So oh my we're passing the torch on that one. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. And you know what? They are so lucky, Isabella and Billy, to grow up in a in a musical household. It must be it must be such fun for them. Yeah, I hope so. Well, we've been talking for over an hour and I feel like I could talk to you for more, many more hours, but is there anything you'd like to um, say to the folks at St. James? We've been separated for a while now and I know everyone's so happy to see you tonight. Yeah. Um, any message for us? Well, I, you know, I think like many of us, I really long for the moment when we can all be back together and, you know, experiencing the beauty of St. James and our liturgy and, you know, just the experience of being in community together. Um, you know, I think it's really, it's incredible to see the ways that we've been able to stay in touch over the last six months with technology and, you know, everything that you and Justin have done to faci facilitate series like this. And Well, and don't forget you, you know. playing organ in your garage or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a garage band now, We right? all have our, our parts to play, but, um, you know, I think, you know, for me, you know, it, it's valuable and as, as enriching as it is to be able to, you know, maintain contact on a weekly or daily basis with everybody. I think it really underscores just, you know, the need for us to be in community in person and just how valuable that is for all of us spiritually and emotionally and physically. Yeah. Um, you know, and the other thing I would just say is, you know, from the very first day at St. James, it's been incredible to be a part of a congregation where, you know, the, the congregation and the clergy um, place such value on the beauty of liturgy and the role that music has to play in enriching our liturgy together and, you know, ultimately serving the word and serving the theology. Um, you know, I've served many churches and many of them have been supportive of music and the arts. Other ones, I'm sorry to say not so much, but, you know, we're, it's incredible for the support that we have from you and mm -hmm. from everybody, you know, to, to really bless us and support what we do as musicians to serve the community. I do think that this time that we're living in now helps us see more clearly than ever what we've got. Absolutely. James. And, and you're a very, very, very important part of it. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Well, you are too. Here. So sure. thank you. <laughs> Blessing St. James with your amazing gifts. And I'm so glad that tonight people have gotten this sort of panoramic view of, of who you are. And they might not have known all these things about you, um, but it's, it's thrilling. And thank you for being our guest tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Good night, all everyone. Right. Have a good, good night. Thank you. Take care.